feeling we're going to have the two minute rush is going to continue to come in trickle in the door but let's go ahead and and get started and uh, very thankful for the facility that our God provides uh, he's good in every way um, August 2 for some announcements August 2 men's study at 1 p.m. that is a week from tomorrow August will be here isn't that some well a week from today August will be here but yeah the men's study a week from tomorrow Board meeting, August 9 at 9 a.m. Our upcoming missionary visits, we are getting closer to all the details worked out. Uh, Carter's here on August 8, and uh, Matthew and Sarah Titus and family here on September 12. Uh, another announcement before I forget, our cucumbers have gone crazy. There's a big bag. Please take cucumbers home if you like cucumbers. Take lots of them. And uh, Carrie grew Italian 
cucumbers and they're like thin? Japanese. Huh? Japanese. Japanese. That's why I said Japanese, Italian <laughs> cucumbers. Pretty close. Yeah, Jap Japan, yeah, Italy. I mean, not too far, but um, th th they're really good. And uh, I it's just I can do those like tomatoes. Just grab one, kind of brush it off a little bit, right out of the garden, and start chomping. So, uh, please help yourself to those. Um, any other announcements that I need to bring our attention to this morning before we get into our prayer requests? Okay, let's go into our prayer time. Uh, Debbie said John's, uh, he's making it through the radiation the five days a week, but it's really becoming difficult, sore throat. Um, it's just, just becoming a very difficult part of the journey. Um, do you have a Julia report? Just goes for number two on Thursday. Number two? Second okay, second treatment on Thursday, so we'll try to remember that. And uh, Randy and Kelly are coming in, in the door as we speak. We want to keep them in our prayers and Chuck and Janice. Chuck and Janice are back in town, I believe. And Well, I know they are unless they left again. And uh, so, and then the others, Ron and Connie, um, Gaylord and Epi, and Harvey at the Memory Care at Lemoyne. Um, again, our, our list is, is very, very long now. Keep all of them in our prayers. Any other prayer concerns to draw our attention to uh, this morning? Yes. I'd like to include Jeanette in that. Jeanette. Jeanette, yes, yes. We need to make sure we pray for Jeanette. And uh, she is bravely marching on, but it's hard, isn't it, Marlon? And, uh, uh, you know, I uh, hit 92 Thursday. Hit 92 Thursday. Well, happy birthday to you. Yeah. You've been around here a while. No stuff. Yeah. Okay. And um, Randy said that uh, Leanne is, is doing okay. Would that be accurate, yeah. Randy? She got through. She got through the surgery. She had surgery. Was it Tuesday? Monday. Uh, Monday, cancer surgery, and um, so anyway, she did make it through. That was a hard, hard thing. All these are very hard, very difficult things. Well, yes. I just want to praise the Lord for providing the means for my car. I got to drive it to church today. No rattle, no leaking any freezer. Anything. Okay, okay. I'm so thankful to him for that. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. Uh, Randy. Tomorrow I've got a pet scan. Okay, and what goes well, he means, is that that uh, tumor will be much smaller. Is that correct? Yes. And yeah. The, uh, seven hours came all on Wednesday. Okay, so you've got quite the week ahead of you. Okay, um, very thankful to be here this morning, aren't you? Yes. No matter what goes on in our lives personally in this world, we have our rock, our high tower, our refuge, our strength, our God, our deliverer. And we come together and we let him remind us and teach us what we really need to know, don't we? Let's pray. Mighty God, how we do love you, how we thank you, how you care for us, how you've provided salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord and the Savior. We thank you also because of that provision that we can, as a group, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can boldly approach your throne of grace, not from anything that we've done, but in the strength and the power of the shed blood of the Lamb. So we do bring these many requests before you, and I'm sure unspoken requests and, and things that we won't bring, uh, we won't verbalize this morning, but that will be on our hearts and minds. And we do bring Jeanette before you continue to strengthen her and, and hold her and we thank you for her firm faith that she knows the promises of God she knows her true future with you we lift up thinking of Jeanette makes me think of Janice Cam away from us and uh, just uh, the tip being <clears throat> gone now already with the Lord and we just pray that you would watch over her and care for her as you have been Pray with Randy this PET scan tomorrow. And our heart's desire, Lord, for our brother is that they will see significant 
reduction in the size of this tumor. Uh, we pray for him as he has uh, uh, the chemo coming up later in the week, as Julia has it coming up, I believe Rich said on Thursday. For John and his continued radiation treatments and the, such a hard journey, all of that is. Um, Lord, we have some away, <clears throat> away from us this week uh, traveling. And uh, I know there's others, uh, great concerns, Lord, that aren't coming to my mind right now, but um, they're dear to you. Uh, we, we thank you that we can be here. We thank you for the health that you give us, the, the wonderful provision, the, just the, the, the thought, Lord, of you one day taking us to be with yourself and, and forever showing us the riches of your grace. How we praise you. Help us to remember what's, what's of first importance. Help us to remember the things that we need to know. Help us to be strong and courageous in a very topsy-turvy world, a confused world, a very dark world. Help us to shine brightly in the name of our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you like to stand as we sing our first hymn for today? We're going to sing the first four verses, and then we're going to do the key change real quick. My one day is then we're going to sing the last verse. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. His music in the sinner's ears, His life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise, ye dumb. Your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come. And leap ye lame for joy. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. If you like to be Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In Him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise my rock, he's my fortress, he's my deliverer, in him will I trust, praise the name of Jesus.
Holy Spirit of God, uh, thank you for blessing us in the way that you have already this morning. Thank you the way that you bless us every second, every moment of our lives. Uh, sometimes we realize it, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we know we're in the presence of God, upheld by you in everything. Sometimes we don't, but we know your word of truth, how we love your word of truth. And you tell us, you speak reality to us, that you're always there, you're ever present. You'll never leave us or forsake us. You'll supply all of our needs, everything for this life's journey. We thank you for this worship service being part of that supplying to us. Holy Spirit of God, we pray, we ask that you would do that this morning. Teach us your words of truth. Bury them deep into our hearts, that we live them, that we know them, that, bring, that we bring you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We do not seem to understand the wrath of God as we should. And if I'm being really honest this morning, sometimes I wonder if we understand it at all. I wouldn't expect unbelievers to either understand or accept what scripture has to say about the wrath of God. But what about those of us who profess belief in Jesus Christ and his word of truth. Why is it that the biblical teaching of the wrath of God, for some, it's like the embarrassing relative that shows up for Christmas dinner. You know how that goes. Everyone is looking at each other. No one wants to sit by weird Uncle Harry or eccentric, eccentric Aunt Sally. So be courteous and polite respectful of course but keep your distance but if you distance yourself from the biblical view of the wrath of God see now we've created a few a huge problem for ourselves because you've distanced yourself from God as he clearly and often clearly and often reveals himself in scripture one example Nahum Chapter 1, verse 2, the Lord, Yahweh, is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord, Yahweh, is avenging and wrathful. The Lord, Yahweh, takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. This is God talking Hebrews 10.30, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If you are distancing yourself from the biblical teaching of the wrath of God, then let me tell you something that should scare your pants off. When you distance yourself from God, as he reveals himself in his word, then that God, the God of the Bible, is replaced in your mind by a God of your creation, a God of your human imagination. In more simple terms, God becomes who you think he should be and not who he says he is. That's scary territory. So this morning... I'm asking you to join me in looking at the wrath of God as maybe you have not before. I have to admit I hadn't looked at it in this way. My hope is that you will be as thrilled as I have been when you see a God who hates sin and he's done something about it. First this morning, a great and amazing sign introduces the final sequence of the great and amazing work of the wrath of our holy God. Revelation 15 verse 1, 
Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. Now what I want to do is build this as we go forward, try not to jump ahead of myself, so be patient, and um, I, think, I, think you will be, I think you will be very strengthened and encouraged as we together understand more and more what the wrath of God is, who God is. We learn more and more actually who our God is. A very great and amazing marvelous sign announces the finishing work of the wrath of God. Great, megas, and, and amazing or marvelous, some of your translations. It's um, thalmat, thal, thal, yeah, yeah, I always, thalmastas, and, uh, but it's great and amazing. It's, we can't let that go. It's a great and amazing sign. Also, the same two words are going to speak when they're, they're singing uh, the song of Moses and, and of the Lamb. Uh, a few verses later, they're going to be singing of the great and amazing. It's the same two words. This great and amazing deeds are the great and amazing and amazing works of God. The great and amazing blessing of God comes to its ultimate realization through the finished work of the wrath of God. This final finishing stage of the wrath of God is essential as God prepares the redeemed of the Lord for glory. See, this word finished is very interesting too because the base is teleo, which is the same word you'll see in your notes in John 19.30, which we're more familiar with. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. To tell us die. It is finished. It's the same word. The base is teleo. It's, it's finished. This work is accomplished. This is the same word that's used at the end of this verse that uh, for with them the wrath of God is finished. That showing us there's a, a completion that needs to come about. And that's really the exciting and the strengthening part of the wrath of God. And um, we see that Christ finished his work of salvation and satisfied God's wrath for all who believe. What Christ, his provision was a finishing work that we can be prepared for God's finishing work of his wrath. Philippians 1.6, it uses the word, it, a different English form, but it says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. It's the same word. He will finish his work in us. He will finish the work of his wrath and, and that's what we need to understand what, what that is. It is judgment, but it is judgment that yields an eternal blessing for those who believe God. Those who do not receive Christ's substitutionary act of wrath taking must drink the full measure of God's wrath. He will finish the outpouring his wrath of his wrath on all unconfessed, unrepentant sin and sin sinners, those who refuse to believe God and receive his provision through Christ. And we went over some of this last week, but it bears repeating the propitiation, Christ taking our wrath. We looked at that, 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 that he was the only person at that time who had, who had drunk the cup, the full cup of God's wrath. He did that in our behalf. We didn't use this verse, so we'll use this this week, Romans 3.24, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So when we see a little bit later the conquerors, what is their testimony? Why were they, able, why were they standing by the glassy sea? It was by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Well, this is what it's speaking of here, the blood of the Lamb. as a propitiation paid for by his blood to be received by faith. What is that? That you believe what Christ has done in your behalf. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. And you have some other references there. 
See, one thing that helped me as I studied this text and the wrath of God just stood out, it, it's like so many things. Let's just try to get the, a very basic understanding of what the wrath of God is instead of having all of these things that come to our mind. And the wrath of God is his intense, passionate, furious hatred of sin. Okay, we need to hang on to that. That's what that is. It, God, God really hates sin. And you're saying, well, you know, teach me something new. Well, no, the, it, it's not new, but stop and think about it. God really hates sin, and he will do something about it forever. It will be brought, it, his, when his wrath is finished, sin will be finished. He will bring this to completion. The word for wrath here, thumos, describes the fierce passion God possesses in his hatred of sin. This word describes God's fury in response to sin and the effects of sin in the world he created. And I'll interrupt myself here just a moment. So hopefully by now in our, in our heart, in our mind, we're, we're understanding if we didn't before or if, even if we did before, we're growing in our understanding of God's opposition to sin, God's intolerance of sin, and so what Christ has accomplished for us, that God can embrace us in Christ because he has done something about our sin. Uh, Paige Patterson uh, writes, Indeed, the word for wrath in the text is once again thumos or fury, where one might have expected to find or gay the settled disposition of God against evil. And those words are both used uh, quite a bit in the New Testament. But what John uses here, it's, it could, we could almost say God's emotional response. It's his passionate hatred of sin. <clears throat> MacArthur said that Tumas wrath is a strong word describing rage or a passionate outburst of anger. Next, we see something that, that we, we start to see the blessing coming in view. And this is a truth that we already know, but I think, I think, maybe, I think what, maybe our focus gets uh, sharpened with this. The wrath of God satisfies the righteous, holy justice of God and frees him to pour out his blessing and to share himself and his glory with us forever. See, without the wrath of God, well, well let, me just, let me just start. I'll start, I'll read verse 3, <clears throat> Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, here's where I want us to start understanding the blessing, the, the amazing the great and amazing work of the wrath of God, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. That would not be possible without the wrath of God. It's not going to happen. For God so loved the world, his love would not be possible without the wrath of God. He has to do something about sin. It has to be effective, it has to be complete, and it has to be forever. And yet, pulpit after pulpit, we shy away from the wrath of God. It's the, it's the awkward cousin that you, you, you don't want to be rude and you don't want to reject them, but you, you really don't want to hear much of what they've got to say either. Because after all, isn't that kind of judgmental or, or whatever? Well, it is judgmental because we're either judged for our sin as Christ it takes our place, or you one day will take drink the, the full cup down to the dreg, Scripture says, the full cup of the wrath of God. This wouldn't be possible having every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places if God did not hate sin and decide he would do something about it. It goes on in this text, even as he chose us in him, all these things that are happening here, none of this would be happening. None of this would be reality without the wrath of God. Back again to that basic understanding the wrath of God is his intense, passionate, furious hatred of sin. 
this universe would become a cesspool. Darker than we can imagine. Depths of sin and wickedness deeper than we can imagine, if not for the wrath of God. All these things coming up in this text, none of this would be true or would be happening if not for the wrath of God. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him would not happen without the wrath of God. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. You can read the rest of that. I want to go down to Ephesians 2, 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That would not happen if not for the wrath of God, if not for God's intense hatred of sin. Him recognizing that and, and dealing that. He will, he, he, he will, sin will not be allowed to contaminate eternity to contaminate his glory. He will deal effectively and completely with it. We're seeing this in our Revelation text as he pours this out. Actually, the final, final judgment will be the great white throne. And at that final, final judgment, then all who have not believed God will be cast into the lake of fire. And I think we, it was last week or the week before that we see that there are two, the, fault, the, the Antichrist and the false prophet, they go straight to the lake of fire. So, what we want to take understand then is Romans 8, 1 better possibly. Therefore, there is now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why is that? The wrath of God. The wrath of God in all of his fury and all of his vengeance is dealing with sin, but he dealt with it for those who believe to those who are in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus took all of that for us. So there's no, there's no condemnation to be brought toward us. That next text speaks to that in Romans 8.31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? How does God open the fountain of blessing? Yes, it, yes, it was God who's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Yes, he saved us by his grace. But essential and prominent in that is the wrath of God. Without the wrath of God, the building collapses. It's a house of cards. God has to, he has a hatred for sin. He will, will deal with sin. So now he can freely, because in Christ, because we've, see the very simple thing, we've believed God over everything else. You'll see a common theme, we believe God over everything else. Now he can freely give us all things that has been opened up through Jesus Christ. Who will bring charges against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, who is the one who condemns. Christ Jesus is he who died, but rather was raised, who is at the right hand of God and who intercedes for us. Second this morning, those who conquered the beast, to the blessing beast, sing of the blessing of the outworking of the wrath of God as a great and amazing work of God. Revelation 15, 2, And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds. These are the same two words. The, 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 the mega, the great deeds, amazing, wonderful deeds, uh, works. Great and amazing are your deeds, your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations who will not fear you O Lord and glorify your name for you alone are holy all nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed they're proclaiming 
the, all the works of God. So that definitely is this, the wrath of God, his work of wrath is front and center in this text. So it is a great and amazing work of God that has been announced by a great and amazing sign in heaven. Back to verse 1, the seven angels with the seven bowls of wrath. Those who conquer the beast know that they are standing beside the sea of glass because of the great and amazing works of God. They're singing about those very things. They, they know why they're there. They believed it before they were martyred. They believed it through all of the, the earthquakes and the burning of the earth and the beheadings and all of those things. They believed that. And now they're standing, and you know, what's, what's interesting is um, they've been given these harps. It says that, um, and, it's, and um, standing beside the sea of glass uh, with harps of God in their hands. Now, I, I don't want to take away from the text, but can you imagine how wonderful that is? And then when they discover they've never had a harp in their hands in their life. And they discover they can play this harp. I mean, you really think in this scene that they're going to have a harp in their hand and not play it? Is, is our God, the tenderness of our God, they've, they've just, they've, they've left this sin-torn planet. They kept believing God and kept believing God. The fury of God's wrath on earth, the fury of the devil's wrath on earth. And now here they're standing, they're conquerors, they've won. And just as God adds these touches, it's, it's a, a harp in their hand. And, and some of them, are, and they're singing, and some of them probably said, this is how I thought I might sing in heaven. I can, I can really sing. Great and amazing, they say, the works of God. And, of course, that's all of them. But, again, front and center is the wrath of God, the work of the wrath of, of God. Um, so they're there. They know why they're there. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. And I'll drop down to um, verse, uh, into verse 10. The accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. They were going to believe what God said until they died. And that's what we looked at. That's what a martyr is. A martyr may die, a martyr may not die. It's one who has a testimony. But the martyr is the one who, if the occasion comes that they have to die, they will die. They may not die, but they will die. And they believe God to the very, to the very end. Um, Revelation twelve twelve speaks of the devil has come down to you in great wrath, and uh, it's the same. I just his great wrath is on earth now. The God's great wrath is on earth now. It's not the best place to live, but as conquerors, Romans eight thirty seven. Whether it's now or 400 years ago, or at this time as we look ahead um, in Revelation, and know in all these things we are more than conquerors, now through him who loved us. See, it's always focused on Jesus Christ, him who loved us. This is why he, the, he, he took the wrath of God on Calvary. This is why these things, everything comes through Christ, through Christ as as revealed, as presented from Scripture. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those who conquer sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. It's a song of deliverance. Um, I've got some notes in here from commentators. That's just for your, really for your use. We're not going to look at that a lot, but it just kind of um, substanti gives, us, gives us more insight that this, why this, well, for instance, this, they show it was a song of deliverance. Deliverance for the Israelites, it was a song of judgment on the Egyptians. And this is the same thing here. 
their deliverance and the judgment of the beast and his minions. Those who conquer sing of the great and amazing works of the Lord God Almighty. Those who conquer sing of their king who is just and true in all his ways and rules the nations. Those who conquer sing of reverence and glory to the Lord. And you'll see all of that um, in, uh, well, let me, let me just go back and read the verses three to five, three to four rather of Revelation 15. I think I skipped part of that. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great amazing are your deeds. O Lord God the Almighty, just and true are your ways. O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And so then when you see here in your notes later, all these things I'm bringing out that they're singing of are right from that text. Those who conquer sing of reverence and glory to the Lord. Those who conquer sing of God's holiness. Those who conquer sing of the nations coming to worship the Lord as his righteous acts will be ultimately revealed. <clears throat> you have this wonderful verses, verses in First Chronicles 16, 28, 29. <laughs> Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord Yahweh glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord Yahweh the glory due his name, bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. And again, the opportunity that we have, you know, our, our lives are so mundane, aren't they? It's just get by, you know, from one, one day to the next. But then God gives us an opportunity once a week to meet together like this. And, and to be before God in, in a special way that we're, that we're not before God. We to, were to be before him all, all throughout our week, but as a, the, the gathering of the saints and um, ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord, Yahweh, in the splendor of holiness. It should thrill our souls that we can, that we can do that, that he's, he's brought us to that place in our hearts and minds where we believe God now and we know the things that we should do. Um, third main point this morning, just wanted us to think on this. The great and amazing work of the wrath of God is carried out by seven angels dressed in holy clothes who come out of the holy temple of God in heaven. Revelation 15, 5, After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels and the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. And I've got a note in there in the NASB because one of the commentaries uh, speaks to the temple of the tabernacle, tabernacle and that's the different the different way that that was uh, translated. But what comes to my mind is, you know, we had the, the DVD, the, uh, the American Gospel. And, and if you remember in that, the, 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 the people in that that just could not tolerate the idea of the wrath of God and how horrible it would be that God would turn his wrath on his, his son, how un, unloving that would be. And if you remember the one man, and, and he said, he said, you know, that, he said, the God of my imagination, I prefer him much over that God of wrath, that God of scripture. Now we, we think, oh boy, how can you do that? But, but any time that we refuse to, to uh, accept, to understand and accept God as he reveals himself in scripture, you're doing the same thing. Any time you substitute your, our human thought for God's clear revelation. Anytime we, we back off and we, it, how, how shameful it is that we back off the, the wrath of God like God has done something wrong. And how foolish. How could we be more foolish, foolish? You know what stood out in these verses that I just read? Where did they bring out the bowls of wrath from? Some commentators believe it's the holiest place in heaven. You don't bring bad things, things to ignore, things that you're ashamed of, out of the holy of holies in heaven. You follow what I'm saying? 
the bowls of wrath, this great presentation, the drama, the solemnity of the moment, the necessary work, the great and amazing work of the wrath of God. They brought the, let me just read that again. After this, I looked in the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was open. Some people believe that's like the holy of holies in heaven. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen. This is how the, these holy angels, this is how they're prepared. <clears throat> It's like more holiness. I don't think that's probably possible. But if you get the idea, they're already in heaven's already a holy place, but now they're brought out. They're, here's your here's your dresser. Here's where you get ready. <clears throat> and one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever. And uh, that's why I've got in the notes. How holy is this moment? How holy is this moment to think of people who prefer the God of their imagination to the God of the Bible because of their severe distaste for and rejection of God's revelation of himself as a God of wrath. How foolish is that? We, we see we, we don't understand, and, and even sometimes as a sincere believer, we don't understand, and we, we, just, we do not allow God to instruct us to press this deep into our heart what it means the wrath of God he hates sin he has to do something about sin or there will be no all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus to us there will be no glory forever in heaven with him he has to deal with sin and we we, we talk about we say oh the sin in this world we don't know the half of it we don't know the tenth of it of a holy God and what he needs to do. Seven angels come out of the temple in heaven clothed in the righteousness and holiness of God. One of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of eternal God. And the, the, the bowls, the angels came out of the holy place. The bowls were then presented to them. I didn't, I didn't state that correctly a little bit ago, but they were prepared to receive this holy work, the wrath of God coming out of this holy place. Now here's something too that's pretty astounding. The glory and power of God are so intense that no one could enter the sanctuary until this work of the wrath of God was finished. Now you've got some verses. Um, you've got some verses down there. We're not going to look at probably the rest of your notes here after that, after that box, but some of the verses it speaks of here on earth when the glory of God filled the temple and the priests weren't able to carry on the work. And you would expect that more, but this is in heaven. This is how holy this moment is. This is how intense the glory and the power of God are at this time. That, that no one, let me go back and read that, and read that again. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. And that's in heaven. That's just not on earth. That is in heaven. This is a very intense, a very solemn, a very holy moment. Um, <clears throat> as I said, you've got some scriptures there that, that speak to that and some commentary by Walvert and Mounts and, and some others. And that's just kind of FYI for your information. So, in conclusion, back to our conquerors. So, back to our conquerors. Here they are standing by the glassy sea with harps given to them by God himself, singing the song of God's servant Moses and of the Lamb. What a blessing. We, I, we, we will have similar blessing, well, so many amazing things in heaven, but, but what a blessing uh, this, that these people. Well, let me just move along. Over the last two, three, maybe four, five, six years or more, depends on how long they survived uh, during the tribulation, they have experienced powerful spiritual forces ravaging the entire planet with war. And all these things are just right out of the scriptures. I went back and I didn't use, bring all the verses, but they're, they're all right there starting chapter 6, I think. Over the last two, three, four, five, six years or more, They've experienced powerful spiritual forces ravaging the entire planet with war. 
and sowing discontent, discontent among the people of earth to such intensity that murder has become commonplace. Not just, you know, we think Chicago, you think guns and, and murder and, and New York and, and other mega cities around the world, but this is whether you're in the city or you're in a rural area, whether you live in the United States or you live in China, peace has been removed. That's what one of the horsemen did. Peace has been removed from the planet. The other was war, like nation against nation, but this is this is more like individuals, peace and the discontent. And can't we see this over the last two years? The rage and the rioting, the discontent, the resentment, the bitterness. So I'm gonna go burn a building down or turn a car over and set it on fire or whatever it might be. Well, just to the, to the nth degree, it, this will be. A fourth of the earth has been subject to death and famine and pestilence. And then the earthquakes came. Terrible, terrible earthquakes, flattening cities, changing the landscape. By that time, it was clear to everyone on earth that the wrath of God had come. Now, by this time, there were, were no doubts that, that it wasn't just something happening uh, in, to the planet, some geological shift or whatever. No, Revelation 6.15, Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Then came hail and fire, and a third of the earth was burned up. We saw, was it yesterday? I think it carried, had this, some news channel on, and it showed this forest of fire. I don't know where it particular was, and it just struck me just how awful that must be. Well, how about when a third of the earth is doing that? A third of the earth is being burned up it says and a third of the sun moon and stars are struck and darkened scorpion demons were released from the abyss to torment the unrepentant for five months and 200 million mounted troops of demons were freed from their bonds and given the power to inflict three plagues fire and smoke and sulfur by which by which one third of the human population was killed so every three out of every three people one was killed the dragon, who we have learned is the devil, Satan, the ancient serpent, the deceiver of the world, has instituted a worldwide religious, political, economic system that demands allegiance or death. But here are our conquerors, harps in hand, singing to God. A great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages who have been murdered for staying loyal to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now here's what I'm getting to. How did they do that? How did they win? How did they come through all that as victors? And how do we, how do, we do that? <clears throat> the simple but very clear and profound answer has been and always will be. We believe God. Everything, underneath everything, we, we believe God. We believe God when it comes to salvation. We believe God when it comes when he reveals who he is, what the things that he must do. We believe God over and above and everything else. We believe and trust. We believe God and trust what he says. Just, that, that's the one thing we can hang on to. For We, we talk about, we bemoan all the, the media outlets, and whether it's online or TV or whatever it is, and you never know who to believe. Well, don't say that, because there is always one you can believe. That is right. There's always one, and we always need to believe him. Above everything else, no matter how confusing, no matter all the turmoil, we, you, you believe God. So we need knowledge of his word. We need to be in his word. 1 John 5, 4, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. We believe God. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So I've got a simple conqueror's principle to put in your pocket and carry out the door with you this morning. No matter what happens to you, heart, cancer, economic collapse, no matter what happens to you or me or what happens uh, to this planet, 
no matter how dark and confusing things become, believe God. Hang on to that. Believe God. Trust God. And you win. And we'll stand before the Lord one day. And it will be great and amazing. But none of that would come about if not for God's intense hatred of sin, his wrath, his tumas, and the fact that he, was, he, he decided to do something about that, that we could have a way to be with him forever and ever. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved from all of that. You could die on this earth. Of course we will unless the rapture comes. But we will be with him one day because of his provision through Christ. Let's pray. Mighty one, how we thank you for your word of truth and for speaking to us today. I pray that you have spoken to, to each of us and, and we've each heard you spirit what we need to hear. Help us to be strong and courageous. Help us to be um, people of faith to allow you to change our hearts and minds, to transform us by the renewing of our minds, to love you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love you first and foremost above everything, to be a light shining brightly in this world of ours, uh, pointing to you, to your salvation, and to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day given us. We thank you that we have victory in Jesus. Amen. We thank you for each one that's come to hear thy word this morning. We just pray that we will take this home with us and keep it close. We thank you for a pastor that preaches the word. Yes. Guide direct us throughout this beautiful day. Yes. And uh, people traveling today, we pray you be with them. And people that uh, we had lots of requests this morning, we pray for them as well. Guide direct us now throughout this day and bring us back tonight for a study around thy word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. amen.